Welcome to a new edition of the Famous Interviews with Joe Domino. On this episode, we talk with jazz musician, creative coach, podcaster, and author, Alan Paul. He strives to help creatives in all walks of life to harness the essential tools to impact the world while living in harmony, abundance, and in line with timeless principles. He has built multiple brands and creative platforms, written four books and resources, and runs a successful faith-centered creative platform, God and Gigs, while coaching others to do the same with their gifts. He's got a great story. Enjoy. Okay, cool. Great to meet you. Thanks for taking a minute out. Oh, no, thank you for for the opportunity. It's great to run into you, especially being a jazz cat on this platform. So thank you for taking a minute out. And I would love to start our conversation off before we get into your life and music by asking how you survived COVID. I know firsthand I ramped up my interviews in 2020 with the jazz community in a pretty unprecedented way um, just to kind of, you know, I, I think a lot of musicians, especially those that were in Brooklyn and other areas, were really feeling isolated, and it was a really good way to connect. So I'm curious with you, I guess, first of all, where are you coming out of? Well, I'm coming out of um, South Florida here. In, uh, I live in like the Florida, uh, the Fort Lauderdale area, and uh, Miami, pretty much, you know, greater Miami area, whatever you want to call it. And uh, as far as COVID is concerned, it's a great question because, you know, three years removed, it's kind of like, you know, we're all, as musicians, I think, more uh, seasoned and stronger than we were because if we survive COVID now, you know, in, in this in this, um, this area, whether it be streaming or AI, it's like, well, we survived COVID, so <laughs> we'll be okay. So my personal story with that was um, I actually was about to play a uh, a R&B slash smooth jazz festival with a, a great artist um, on the weekend that COVID hit and they canceled. That's how we found out. Like we were literally in the rehearsal hall and um, they gave us a call and said, yeah, jazz in the gardens is canceled. Um, that's when we were like, okay, this is going to happen. Now just what happens the next week I had a gig scheduled and me and this blues singer uh, 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 and a guitarist were like, what are we going to do? So we just grabbed a webcam uh, I threw up some PayPal links and created a VIP slash music house concert, virtual concert for the people that we were going to perform for. And that ended up being 30 concerts of what I called Keep the Music Playing. So I actually created a concierge style house concert uh, music live stream series. Uh, that's how I got through COVID. It was amazing. Like it showed me the power of the community, um, people who are willing to just come over to the house one at a time, you know, and, and, and perform. Uh, it, it taught me a lot about, again, like, you know, what we're capable of doing as musicians when we need to still keep, literally keep the music playing, which is what I called it, but we, we found a way to do it. And whether people did live streams, whether they did, you know, whatever they did, recordings, and like you said, interviews, the same thing I did with my podcast. I did a ton more interviews because people were available. So I think we all just found a way to, like, keep what we were doing well doing and do it in a different way, a different, different method. And, uh, yeah, it taught me a lot and definitely was a, uh, it, was, it was really a high point in a weird way of my, you know, creative, creative life and my music life. You know, it's interesting. One of the most prevalent terms that came out of COVID was mental health. And I think the other one is the term pivot. I think that's the big thing is that we all had to kind of be like kangaroos and just shift our body completely to the right and just move on down the road because there was a lot of things that we had to figure out. But I think the thing that you noticed from my end of the microphone is that there was a fear that a lot of jazz musicians were going to leave big cities and, you know, those that were in college may reconsider. But from what I'm getting overall, the jazz community is stronger than ever. I would agree. Yeah, I would agree that, again, like I think that with all the challenges that have faced jazz, that it's faced live music, that people, you know, again, I mentioned AI, I mentioned streaming, I mentioned all these other different, you know, things that uh, – have, you know, jazz education, you know, you name it. There's been all these different things where people say, oh, well, you know, we're we're doomed. And then every time jazz comes back, jazz has never really left. And I think it's, again, it's a, it's a key uh, element of where it came from, of, of it came from struggle. It, cre- it came from a, a, a incredibly uh, mixed up time socially, economically, and, you know, culturally, and yet we get this beautiful music out of it. And so the idea that somehow, you know, what <laughs> they were going through in the 1900s that created this music is worse, or, or sorry, that to what's going on now is worse than what was going on back then. It's like, no, I think if we survived, it was able to be thriving in an environment like that, and then be born in an environment like that, that's going to be great. 
now. I think musicians, like you said, like the great the guys that I play with down in here in uh, South Florida, uh, we're very, very interesting and very different from maybe the New York scene or the Chicago scene or the LA scene. Or, but it is still, you know, thriving and growing because people are coming to that fact. Like, wow, we do a particular thing very well, and we're going to own it. And we're not going to worry about what, the way anybody else does it or, you know, the different obstacles that come in our way. You know, it's interesting. I think about a lot of vignettes. You kind of opened up the portal of my brain that I, I haven't remembered for a while. I remember one of the early interviews I had was with a musician that lived in New York and the, and the hustle and bustle. And he just picked up and moved to Costa Rica, found out what was going on, figured if this was going to be raging, he was going to go somewhere. And I remember talking to him and a lot of musicians saying that of all of the artists that exist out in the world, jazz musicians are the ones that are always in the middle of improv. You get into the unknown, you have to make something the best out of a situation, no matter what. So it almost seemed like you were the artists that were made for the COVID time. You lived that no matter what, whether it was COVID or not. And this was just emblematic, like you said before, of the way that this art form came to birth to begin with. Yeah, such a great point. And yeah, I do believe that um, the nature of uh, our, our 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 art, our craft demands that you have that kind of flexibility. It demands that you you make something out of out of you know you know like Miles Sills, right? There are no wrong notes, there are no bad notes. You you turn them into good notes. You turn something that looked like a devastating thing on the entire creative community, entire music community. And you turn it into something else. So yes, I know that there's tons of great records that probably wouldn't have been made had guys not been stuck in their houses, right? And that's, again, we're not we're not dismissing the the, the 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 horrible things that happened, you know, during the pandemic. But we're also saying, hey, look at the good. Look at the the amount of people who like you know really had to turn to music because they had nowhere else to turn, right? So a lot of people, like I said, I mentioned my live stream series, and I mentioned other people that. You know, um, I think it was it was Emmett Cohen. I can't remember who else it was. There was somebody that did like a huge uh, thing and is still doing it, right? And is still getting out to new audiences. Um, and I I really love the fact that you you know you've really pushed uh, or really hit on that fact that jazz musicians we're, we're, we're resilient by nature um, and we're 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 hardworking by nature. <laughs> Uh, you know, you don't get into this, you know, this, this this genre and not know like, hey, this is gonna, you know, take a lot of work and take a lot of sacrifices. So, not that again, all all musicians know this, but especially in this genre, um, I think that we are dedicated to seeing this through through hard times. Um, and yeah, I think COVID brought out, you know, showed it in a in a, in a new way that we never would have guessed that would have been uh, the case. So take me back to the beginnings of your jazz journey. Where were you born and raised? Who were some early influences? How did this take hold on you? Well, I was raised up in North Florida, Northwest Florida. I usually call it East Alabama because most people, you know, the panhandle kind of like it's just a forgotten part of Florida, it seems. But uh, that was Pensacola, Florida, and I grew up with my mom, who was my first music teacher. My dad uh, was a, had a dental practice up there, so all the way through high school, was a was a band geek and uh, got introduced to jazz really sitting on the floor of my uh, I think my my brother had some project and we were doing it he was asleep I remember this very vividly because you know I was mad because we had to do his project for him and uh, NPR was playing uh, Miles and a little bit of So What and I was entranced and uh, that was the beginning of me jumping from classical music which I was already studying into jazz uh, did a couple of uh, uh, summers up in Interlochen. Um, for, for classical, did the same thing, ran away from the classical side, tried to get over there to the jazz side. And uh, the same thing happened in school when I went to the University of Miami, uh, went in as a classical student. But um, as soon as I could, switched over to uh, a jazz emphasis with my music edu- education degree. So that's how my you know professional career started, just, just wanting to become more and more entranced with this music. Um, you know, my, my, my patron saints, Herbie and Keith Jarrett, and, um, you know, in Chick Korea and just, you know, actually even in classical, uh, my pathway through was Gershwin because I played the Gershwin Concerto for the Tampa Bay Symphony uh, when I won the con- competition back when I was a teenager. And that was the one thing that made me want to practice was that, hey, yeah, now I get to melt these worlds. So I didn't even realize Gershwin was, you know, the, the jazz composer that he was, but I just knew this was, you know, something that I wanted to play. And so I think that's the bridge. The bridge was, yeah, I got the the, the technique and the the, the 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 theory from my early studies in you know in classical and band and stuff like that. But jazz, the sound of jazz and the and the and the feel of jazz is what 
brought me into being a musician, you know, a professional musician. So, yeah, I'm definitely, you know, grateful for that that foundation. Yeah, my gateway, in quotes, gateway drug, so to speak, was Miles Davis kind of blue as well. So um, I was uh, taking a flight to Seattle, and I never looked back. It was always that warm feeling. Um, but uh, so what was the first concert you ever saw? You know, that, that's the thing about this process of being a musician and even a spectator is that there's always these moments and live music so big. What was that moment for you where you thought, I either want to do this more or I want to be on stage one day? Mm, now, it's funny because I always laugh whenever people ask me about my first concert because I'm almost embarrassed. But now I'm not embarrassed anymore. My dad took me, actually, you won't believe this, to a Neil Diamond concert. I think it was eight or nine. And wow. the reason why it is, yeah, right? And so that's why what is weird, these weird things that like my dad was, you know, was a great music head, never a musician, but he had all the Earth, Wind & Fire records, Commodores, but then right next to them was Paul Simon, Harry Chapin, and James Taylor, and Neil Diamond. So he loved the singer-songwriters as well. And so what I really think kind of sunk into my playing was not necessarily the actual music, necess- you know, although, I, you know, you can't get wrong with Paul Simon and these guys. Like, these are these, the, the greatest songwriters of all time, but... I think that telling a story is what I got out of concerts. Is is not as much the, you know, standing in front of people or being meeting people or being out within the room or it was more every time one of these guys showed up on stage and then I remember in high school I got a chance to be on stage when Slide Hampton came in to do a uh, a workshop and that was one of the times when I was performing on the concert that I was like this is incredible this man has such a, a, a depth and like a warmth to his knowledge. And of course the plane was out of his mind, you know, and I was just like, I get to sit up here and be a part of this. So I would say like those two kind of like centerpieces in terms of concerts. Cause I've never, I've never been a big guy. I, I, I'm almost one of those introverts that, you know, if, if I can hear you at home, I'll hear you at home. But um, I think the, the experience of letting a story be the story and letting a person speak and, and knowing there's the beginning, middle and end, there's a conflict, there's a resolution. Um, to me, in any public performance, that's what I try to bring now. And it's funny that it's probably the first time I've ever drawn that conclusion from that question. So thank you for that. Like, I've never thought about that before that. I always think of my solos as trying to tell a story. And public performance being that chance where it's story time. And so just like in kindergarten, everybody sits around and once upon a time, right? And the intro of my, so- my show is once upon a time, my solo. And I think great songwriters and great singers and great performers take you on a journey they tell a story and so that's been a central theme like throughout my 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 playing and my composing everything like i want there to be that once upon a time and a happily ever after uh in my performances and i think that comes from those first few performances that my dad introduced me to you know it's interesting i think uh neil diamond is the third jazz singer al jolson i never remember the second one it was a trivial pursuit question but it's funny because my dad was born in brooklyn raised in long island full-blooded italian um, and he was a fisherman at heart, so he used to wake me up when, when I was a kid, and he would blast coming to America, and that, you know, <laughs> he was a car salesman, too. He'd always have, like, a new Cadillac or an LTD, always smelled like, you know, wax in there, and he'd blast that radio, and I'm just trying to figure out where I'm at. Neil Diamond's just coming to America, just blaring <laughs> That is a great memory, yeah. <laughs> so... So I'm curious, as somebody that's a veteran jazz musician, there's so many aspects that go into what you do, from, you know, teaching to playing live, recording, you know, promoting, all these things that you have to do. But what is it that you look forward to the most? What gets you charged about being a musician? Uh, Great question. And I think now I have been doing this as a, I call myself a professional, you know, professional local. Um, I've, I've never really been in man, enamored of touring. I've never been enamored of, uh, you know, the limelight. I, I really, the thing that gets me jazzed and, and, and driving as a musician is the collaborative process. It's the sitting down in front of people, with people, around people, um, and making things that didn't exist before and helping them be the bridge or being the bridge that helps them bring a vision uh, to life. That. You know, I do that now, even in terms of what kind of like evolved out of my music career, because now I'm not just a musician, right? Now I podcast, so now I actually interview other musicians and creatives. So it, it's all about being able to get into that process and being able to say, hey, this, wh- where can I be a part of the thing that you're about to make? I've never really been big on being the, the, front, the front man. I've been someone that loves to be the person that says, hey, 
here's what you're thinking, but it could be this. It could be even bigger. It could be even beautiful, even more beautiful. Or we could change it around and try this. And so that collaborative process is 100%, especially now that I'm going to like the second half of my life, I guess you could say, um, I would die a happy man if I could say that other musicians could say Alan was a part of me making some more beautiful music. Um, and, of course, you know, now the overflow of that is that, yeah, I, I also would love to be writing more myself, and I know there's tunes that I need to get out into the world. But um, that's like secondary. It's like a, it's like a, uh, a icing on the cake. Um, so, yeah, when, in, in, in my podcast now, I'm, I'm really kind of like just finding more joy in telling those stories, back to the storytelling, right? And, and telling the stories when I perform, telling the stories when I, when I write, when I, all these other creative sides just lend to the same thing, which is these are amazing people that are doing amazing things. How can I help them become, have a platform and have a, a voice? And, uh, and then musically speaking, how can I be like that person that kind of gives like the glue to uh to the to the ensemble or to the performance or to the to the composition that makes it like shine and and gives it like a new life that's really what makes me happy about as a musician so very simply put why do you love jazz hmm why do i love jazz um i would say it's the one genre that uh provides the most freedom i i feel you know i've played all kinds of music um I don't think I've felt the freedom. And again, that's why I'm always careful. But why I love jazz is because of the freedom. It's because there's a, a inert, it, it, is, it is an escape, inescapable structure, right? Because all music has structure. But there's also an inescapable freedom. There's just no way that you can play jazz and not feel or not sense that this can be whatever you want it to be. And it, 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 it uniquely speaks to me it's when I play um, and it's funny, like when people hear me play and they'll say things like, oh, well, I heard the blues there. I heard the gospel there. I heard some, some, some elements of this, 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 right? And they'll say this to me. And I'm like, really? Because I didn't come here to play a bluesy gospel rockish. I'm playing jazz, right? So the fact that other people can hear other things in my playing and, and I know that that's literally had nothing to do with what I had. That's the beauty of jazz. That's the beauty that people can get all of these parts of me without me having to say, here's these parts of me. Um, the, 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 and of course, the rich history of that, again, like we talked about at the very beginning of this interview, the history of that is that jazz becomes, it illuminates more of what people are and what the culture is and who, and who and I, it gives me a, a avenue for that. So that's, I don't know if that answers the question well, but that's, that's, um, that's, that's I would say that's what I love about it the most. So let me ask you this. If you could get into a time machine and go back in time and see any performance of any musician, where are you going? Who are you going to see? Mm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to say this one. This is going to be a very uh, maybe out-of-the-box answer, but I heard this on the podcast, and this has been, like, rattling my brains. I want to give it because it literally is what, like, I would love to see. I heard that uh, someone mentioned the greatest concert that ever that it ever was, right? But what they mentioned was this was – uh, and this one of my, one again, one of the, the composers that goes way back that, you know, maybe we wouldn't see as jazz, but I heard that uh, Ludwig von Beethoven uh, introduced the Fifth Symphony, the Sixth Symphony, and his Third Piano Concerto all on the same day. <laughs> and that concert was the last time he performed before his deafness took over and he could not perform anymore. And uh, is that, that to me has been that just that, that ringing again, that kind of goes back to what we're saying. Like, what do I have to share that needs to get out now while I have opportunity to do it? And to me, like, I would love to have been there to hear the last time that man performed. Be and then he wrote like six more symphonies, right? Or three, four more symphonies and countless more uh, concertos and things like that. Death. So to me, it's like that has been like really sticky in my head since I heard it. It was like, could, what would I have felt in that? And then every performance, right? Whenever you, you see somebody, you don't know if that's their last one, unfortunately. You don't know if that's like the last time you'll see them perform. So I think every performance takes on that same kind of like wowness. Like you have to take it in while you have the chance. But yeah, like that's funny. Like, but that, you know, when you ask that question, because there's so many artists I would love to see, but that's the one now since you gave me, you know, the time machine. I can go, you know, all the way back to the to the 1800s, and yeah, that's something that I would have just loved to be a part of. 
So everyone out there has a perception of you, family, friends, fans, but you run the show. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Ah, well, you know, my perception comes down to four words. Um, I've had to work with this a long time between therapy and, and, and just, you know, really soul searching. But my, my, my perception of who I am comes down to four words. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a creative, and I'm forgiven. So I can break down those four words if you want, but it's pretty simple. Like I, that perception of me is the, the, the four roles and the four ways that I inter, interact with the world and it's who I am. And, you know, now that 49, like I'm, I, I realize that it's better for me to become more comfortable with that than trying to become something else. Um, and so as a husband, I'm going to stay a husband to my wife for 27 years. Leah has been, you know, there next to me with all this stuff. As a father, I'm always going to be a father. So I'm grateful for my three kids as a creative. I'm always going to be a musician. I'm always going to be a writer. I'm always going to be someone that wants to express themselves through the arts and the creativity. And forgiven, I'm always going to be a man of faith. I'm always going to be connected to, you know, who God made me to be and try to become a better version of that. So, yeah, that's my perception of me. I hope people are starting to see that, you know, you know as I work on that, I hope it lines up with, you know, who they see I am. Right on. That's a great answer, man. So, hey, Alan, if anyone want, out there wants to pick up your work, live shows, anything pertaining to your world, where can they go? Well, if they want to find me in terms of my music, uh, probably the best way is to head over to YouTube, Alan Paul Music. Um, I've been working on my website forever, so I think YouTube is the best way to get to me and uh, also on all platforms, Alan C. Paul. And if you want to check out my other pursuits, my creative pursuits, I also have a podcast called God and Gigs, where I've been talking to some amazing musicians, creatives, and we it talk about the intersection between art, entertainment, and faith. So I've been working on that for seven years, got a couple of books out. So that to me is, you know, my, 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 my new my new vision, my new love, which has intersected perfectly with my music career. So yeah, if they want to check that out, they can find it at anywhere on at God G O D God and Gigs dot com. Alan, this has been great. Thank you so much for opening up. It's so I feel it's so cool to run into somebody that's doing the jazz here in this environment of Podmatch. So thank you for taking time out. Best of luck with everything. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. This was awesome. Thank you so much for having me on the program. Thanks for tuning in to another famous interview with Joe Domino, where we cover the world of art, literature, business, spirituality, music, and more from around the globe. Our esteemed theme music was composed and produced by the great E.E. E. Pointer of Kansas City's River Cow Orchestra. If you want to hear more interviews, visit the Famous Interviews with Joe Domino channel on YouTube. You can also find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and until next time. Yeah.